It's time for the Property Podcast, where every week, tens of thousands of property investors, new and experienced, join together to get news, knowledge, and laughs at our expense. With me, Rob Bentz. And me, Rob Dix. Join us every Thursday morning for your weekly dose of property ideas and motivation. Then head over to our website at thepropertypodcast.com to keep the conversation going. Now though, let's get started. Hello and welcome to the Property Podcast. I'm Rob B. With me as always is Rob D. It's episode 113 and if you are superstitious, this episode is going to be just right for you because it's all doom and gloom. But that's coming up in a bit. First of all, Rob, we always have to start with the niceties. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Um, I'm probably doing about the same for tiredness as you are this morning, I'd have thought. <laughs> <laughs> you are, yeah, for, for once we've leveled out. Yeah, so we're recording this podcast as the election results are coming in. We should really flip this around and talk about the news at the end of the podcast, because by the time we finish recording, it might be a little bit, bit clearer what's going on. But we'll come to that in a minute when we talk about our news story. Our main topic for this week, as you've hinted at, Rob, is how to survive a property crash. It's something we've been asked about a few times. It's going to be an absolutely fascinating one. I've loved preparing for this. Uh, It's all tied into the property cycle, our favourite topic. This is going to be a must listen, I think. Yeah, we've definitely been excited about this episode and we've had help on together as well, which we'll talk about shortly. But before we get to that, There's other big news this week, Rob. Yes, the election results are coming in right now. And yes, we've got a bumper episode. But we've also got Beyond the Bricks in audio. And let's face it, if you listen to the podcast, you clearly like audio content already. So it's great to have that in Audible. Yeah, it's something that I've been asked about so many times. I've had some fantastic reactions to the book, which I'm really grateful for. I've had had lots of emails as well saying, I just never get around to reading books are you going to do it as an audiobook? And I've been putting it off for pretty much a year, uh, but I finally got around to recording it. It's up on Audible right now. I gave away a load of copies in the Property Hub, so well done to you if you spotted that in time and grabbed one of those before they all went. If you didn't, it is on Audible for you to buy. So if you haven't read Beyond the Bricks yet, or if you want to recap it and you prefer listening to audio than you do reading, you'll find it on Audible and you'll find a link to it on Audible in the show notes for this episode, which are at thepropertyhub.net slash crash. Yeah, make sure you check out Audible if you haven't already. We've referenced it as a resource of the week previously. It's absolutely fantastic for consuming books. If I find a, a title that's a bit meatier, then I'll immediately turn to Audible. So at the moment, I'm listening to the Benjamin Franklin autobiography by Walter Eikenson and the same guy who did the Steve Jobs autobiography. It's pretty meaty. So to be able to have it in audio book is so much more convenient than looking a big book around. And yes, I could have Kindle. And, and yes, I'm going to get the Kindle paperwork very soon. But when I'm on my commute, it means I can listen to books, which is just absolutely ideal because I love reading. So if you haven't checked Audible out, make sure you do. And if you do, Make Beyond the Bricks your first purchase. Yeah, please do. So the release of that may be on the front pages tomorrow, or maybe the election will be on the front pages. We'll have to see which way the the journalists lean with that one. But the election is, as we said, Rob, happening right now. Um, The way that it's panning out at the moment, we've, we've had to turn our TVs off so we can concentrate on this. The way it's panning out is a lot more decisive than people previously seemed to think in the run up. And the angle for property investors, well, I would think if we if we set aside individual political leanings, when you're voting, obviously you're taking more into account than just property. But from an investor's point of view, I think this has got to be seen as good news, isn't it? Yeah, for property investors, this we're not saying this is you know the, the right thing for the country or anything else. We're going to stay out of that. But if you listen to the election podcast a couple of weeks ago, and actually even though it's happened, I think it'd be interesting to do so because you can see what's played out. But from a property investor's point of view, this is good news. Not because it's going to be lots of things in our favour. It was more that other parties were going to make it harder for us to to do what we want to do. And, you know, let's face it, we're trying to just provide good accommodation for the people while giving ourselves a pension. Because we we know that normal pension provisions might not be enough. So taking it into your own hands of property could be a way of doing it. And if that's made harder, then I can see why that's been a, a vote loser for for maybe some other parties. But listen to that episode, it'd be really interesting. And actually, if you've subscribed to the magazine, you'll have that on your doorsteps now, which is so exciting. We've got the article in there on the election and what will happen if each individual party gets in. So that's going to be a really interesting read too. And if you haven't subscribed to the magazine yet, make sure you do because issue two, we've already started working on. 
And from the amazing feedback we've had from issue one already, we are so pumped to make issue two even better. And issue one really set the bar high, if we do say so ourselves. Which we do. Um, and the propertyhub.net slash magazine is the place to go to subscribe to that, by the way. But let's get on to our topic of the week then, because it's a biggie. It's a really exciting one. And it was all sparked by this message that we had from Christian. Hi, Rob and Rob. Um, my name's Christian, and I just want to say that I love the podcast. I think it's brilliant. I can't wait for every Thursday just to see, you know, what's going to arrive in my iTunes folder. And I'm already subscribed to the magazine, so can't wait for that as well. Um, I just got a quick question that I hope you could answer in the podcast. I've only been investing for about uh, two years now. Uh, as a result of the podcast, I've got my first house, and I'm looking to buy my second and my third. Uh, in the coming six months, which is quite exciting. But for me, obviously, since I've only been investing for such a short amount of time, I've only seen, I guess, the upside of property. Um, and, you know, things have been going quite well for me. And I just wanted to know a bit of insight on what happens in maybe 10, 12 years when it does go south and the bubble bursts and it's all doom and gloom and tragic. Um, what do we, you know, think will happen? What's our expectations? Will rents be horrible? Will it just be an absolute nightmare? And how do you deal with that situation? Thanks, and I look forward to your podcast. Well, thank you, Christian, first of all, for your kind words, and also subscribing to the magazine. That's great. Hope you're enjoying it. But also for really giving us the push to do this episode. And it's one that we we were talking about before your message came in. And when it did, we thought, right, that's it. We've got to cover it. But then, Rob, more events played out, which have really helped shape this episode more than we'd expect. Well, yeah, while we were thinking about this and getting our thoughts together, we heard from a listener called Ed Atkinson, who said that he'd been putting something together uh, in terms of uh, how to survive a recession. And then when he sent it over, we couldn't quite believe it. Because, well, he's put something together, which you'll hear about in the resource of the week. That's coming up. Um, but he's also put together a report which had some absolutely fascinating analysis and ideas, which we're going to be drawing on heavily in this episode. So if you like anything that we say in this episode, chances are it's an idea we've nicked from Ed Atkinson. And if you don't, it's nothing to do with Ed. <laughs> That's all our idea. Um, but so so there's a lot in this. This is a really, really meaty episode. And it's a lot better for having Ed's contribution. So massive thank you to him. Okay, so let's get going. So first of all, I think it's fair saying that we're pretty good at being realistic about the downside and preaching caution. We're not, we're all going to get rich podcast. You know, we, we preach caution all the time. But we've been asked a few times recently what happens when the next crash happens, as we said. So we're going to talk about how great leverage is. But is leverage such a good idea when that happens? The episode is about how to survive a crash. We're not predicting one, but it's just saying how to be prepared. We think the upshot will be that you'll find this empowering rather than terrifying because you'll have more control than you think as and when it happens. But it's worth repeating, we don't see it anywhere in the short or even medium term happening but we'll talk about that in a bit so if we're going to be surviving a crash we need to know what a crash might look like and everyone is going to remember the most recent one you might remember the one before that or the one before that before that depending on how long you've been around for but let's look at what the last couple have been like and let's start with the 2008 recession, the one that we're all going to remember. So leading up to that, you'll probably remember how different the world was in the three years leading up to that. Average interest rates leading up to the 2008 recession were 5%. And then, as you'll remember, they were promptly cut to half a percent when the recession kicked in. And we're still there now, all these years later. And during that recession, house prices fell, according to Nationwide, by about 16%. On the whole, there were big regional variations in that, of course, as well. The crash before that in 1990 was very different. House prices fell by around the same amount. Around 15% is what's estimated in 1990. But average interest rates for the three years in the, in the run-up were 12.2%. And rather than being cut as they were in 2008, they persisted. They stayed being high. They stayed above 10%. So you've got two very different types of recession there. And it's interest rates that are the real issue. So whenever you've got a crash, you've got falling asset prices. And that's not great news. But it's the interest rates that are the real issue because they push mortgage payments higher. And therefore, it makes it more likely that you're going to be forced to sell a property at the worst possible time because your outgoings have gone up and your rents aren't enough to cover it. And that is the scenario that we want to avoid here, isn't it? I mean, if we're talking about surviving a crash, you want to be coming through it without being forced to sell any properties. 
We often talk about never selling a property, but being forced to sell a property, you absolutely don't want to happen. So I think what a lot of people are scared of when we think about when the next crash comes is those interest rates. People who remember the 1990s will remember those crazy high interest rates. And that's what everyone's afraid of. But there is good reason to believe that interest rates won't get that high in the future. And historically, and this is something which is drawn on in Ed's report that we're going to talk about later, the 70s to the 90s do look like a real anomaly in terms of interest rates. And we talked about things not being necessarily as doom and gloom as you might think. Interestingly, in the three recessions prior to the one around 2007-2008, prices in the trough of the recession were actually higher than they were three years before the recession. And in 2008, that wasn't the case, but they were still only 5% lower in the trough than they were three years before the peak. So what does this tell us? What it tells us is that if you can avoid buying or releasing equity in the two to three years before a crash, then you don't have as much to fear as you might have thought. So enter our old favourite, the property cycle. We love the property cycle. So a reminder, first of all, if you haven't listened to our two episodes that we've done on the property cycle, please go back and listen to them. We get such good feedback from those episodes and I think you'll really enjoy them. Plus, there's some really interesting threads on the Property Hub as well that relate to the property cycle that we'll link to in the show notes. But a quick recap, the property cycle was put together by Fred Harrison. And in the 80s, he released a book called The Power in Land. And he talked about how he's gone back through the data and he sees cycles, property cycles in the US and the UK. And it's almost predictable of what's going to happen and when. Now, admittedly, when we started looking into this, we were a little sceptical. And the more we dug into this, the more convinced we were by its principles. So let's get into specifics. What, what happens during this 18-year cycle? Well, we have a crash, okay? Let's, let's call that the beginning. We've had a property crash. We had one recently in 2008. We then, after that crash, have four years of nothing. So property prices have fizzled out. They don't look like to be going anywhere up or down for four years. Then we have seven years of modest growth. And this is generally stimulated by the government. So for seven years, we have modest growth. Then we have seven years of aggressive growth. At some point in the middle of this, we'll see a wobble. Economic conditions will look scary. People will call the end of the market after the first steady seven years. During this time, the first seven years, property prices on average are growing about 5%. Sound familiar? Because that's where we are right now. We haven't had a wobble yet, and bear in mind, it's not, the property crash is not about this wobble, it's what's coming further down the line. We'll then have roughly seven years of aggressive growth, followed by a crash. But what's interesting, as Rob's pointed out, in the property cycle, Fred Harrison calls the last two years the winner's curse, where this is the point where you should not be investing and actually you know, withdraw, hold back, maybe sell, it's up to you. Some people do follow the cycle, some people just hold and then wait to go again after the crash has occurred. Now, going back through the history, there's debate in the, in the property hub whether you know some of the cycles have been 17 or 18 years, but that's the great thing. We're not talking about it being non-existent or not happening at all. It's just like, is it out by a year or two? So if you can predict roughly when it's going to happen, you can hold back, as Rob said, for the last two or three years while everyone's going absolutely bonkers with the property market and then go again once the crash has happened. Go and listen to those two episodes. We'll link them in the show notes, but they are definitely in the top five must-listen-to podcasts we've done. A couple of points just to be aware of. When are we in that last two years? Well, I mean, you can just do the simple calculation. 2008 to 2012, four years. Another seven years to 19. And then another seven years to 2026. So you could say roughly 2026 is when the next crash would happen. But actually, there's telltale signs. And... If you think back to Dubai, this is a classic example. And this is something that Fred Harrison put in his book in the 80s. So this is not, you know, built around a convenient story now. Looking out for the tallest buildings being built. Vanity projects. Projects that should never really happen uh, unless stupid money's being spent. That was Dubai just before the crash. Think about China now, where all the tallest buildings are. Are they at the end of their 18-year cycle? I, I think they probably are. But we'll see. But they seem to be classic phase of the winner's curse so it just gives you that confidence and there are warning signs there are triggers to make you go wait there it's coming okay so we've seen what a crash might look like when it comes we've talked about whether you can see it coming which we've seemed to be suggesting that you can 
So the episode's called How to Survive a Property Crash. So how do you survive it? If you know that it's coming down the track, you don't know exactly when, but you know that it's going to happen at some point. And because of the cycle and what you're seeing in the world around you, you think it's coming up relatively soon. How do you prepare for that? Well, here are a load of different ways. The first one to start with, because I think this is the most important, don't overexpand during the winner's curse. So in those two years leading up to the crash, when everyone is going nuts, anyone will buy anything from anyone and property prices are going mad. Lending is really easy. Don't be buying then. And this is what we saw last time. In fact, the low interest rates in the 2008 recession saved a lot of people. But even with those rock bottom interest rates, you saw people going bust. And those are the people who'd just been going really, really aggressively recently. People who'd been slowly accumulating for years were fine. You don't want to be buying at that time. And this is really interesting to me because I like to think of myself as a contrarian investor. I'm sure a lot of people do, but I try to be a contrarian investor. And this is where it really pays off. Just when everyone is buying and going crazy is the time when you do not want to be. And we saw lots of very smart people in the lead up to the last recession, very quietly reducing their holdings, just as everyone else was was levering up. You can, of course, refinance to bolster your cash reserves. And that's something we're going to be talking about further. But you don't want to be taking that equity to live on and live the high life with cars and holidays, which is something we saw a lot of last time as well. And you don't want to be buying overpriced properties. So exercising caution during that winner's curse in itself, it could be the key to surviving a crash. Okay, something else you can do is hold properties with a a good yield. So stress test your portfolio at higher interest rates and see how they play out. Bear in mind, you're going to get rent inflation before the, the crash as well. But what was interesting is the last crash, the people who got hurt were the people who were buying properties that produced no cash flow or even negative cash flow. And they were buying just on the on the assumption that property prices are going to go up. So that's where I make my money. So I'm happy to make a loss in the short term. That's a nightmare scenario, especially if interest rates go up. So make sure you stress test your portfolio now. But also, as the cycle comes to an end, or nearer to the end, have a look at your whole portfolio. Are there some that aren't returning as much as you'd expected? Maybe they're ones to look at moving on. Thirdly, another critical point, have cash reserves. This is something I actually talked about on the Property Geek podcast that came out yesterday. Propertygeek.net slash 45 is uh, the link to that one, talking about cash reserves and emergency funds and so on. The absolute key to survival here is cash in the bank. So even if you're cash flow negative, so say that you have a situation where interest rates do go up to 12% or beyond like they did in the 90s. We don't see that happening again. I do think that was an anomaly. But if that happens, then your expenses are obviously going to go through the roof. Your mortgage payments are going to go way, way up. If that happens, then that might put you into a cash flow negative position. So your payments gone up so far, you can't just say to the tenant, very sorry, I'm going to double your rent because my mortgage payments gone up. That's not going to work. So you could be put into a situation where you're temporarily cash flow negative. If that happens and you don't have any cash in the bank, you can't meet your mortgage payments, then you're going to be forced to sell. And this is where the whole thing falls apart. Because if you're trying to sell just as everyone else has realized what's going on, you're going to get a shocking price. You might not be able to sell for enough to actually pay off your mortgage, especially if you've been leveraging up during the winner's curse, as we've just advised against. And that is where bankruptcy happens. If you're cash flow negative and you've got cash in the bank to cover it, then you're okay. You don't like to be in a position where you're having to put money into your portfolio each month while the value of it is declining at the same time. But if you've got cash reserves, then you can do that and you can survive. And as we always say, property is a long-term investment. There will always be dips along the way. The key is to ride out those dips and be continuing to hold property for years and years and years. So if you've got the cash in the bank to survive that period, you could come out of the recession stronger than you went in ultimately. But it's it's that lack of cash that's going to put you in the position where you're forced to sell. And that's where it all falls apart. If you play this right, not only will you be protected, but actually you can take advantage. Because if you see it coming, you get your cash reserves ready. You can clean up when that happens. You can make big purchases at low prices. That's what people did last time. You know, they they withdrew from the market and then they went heavy once it had collapsed. 
So not only can you protect yourself, but it also gives you that opportunity to take advantage. And that's what really excites us and stuff that we discussed in the 18-year property cycle podcast is that having that opportunity to hold back, see it coming, you might be a year or two out, you know, so you, you might see it go for three more years before it collapses. But while that's playing out, you're boostering your cash reserves to take advantage of the market when it does collapse. Another thing you you should be doing is using interest only mortgages. This gives you more control of your outgoings. It's crucial for times like this. Why? Well, because if you've got a capital repayment mortgage, your repayments are obviously going to be higher. So interest only is a mortgage where you only pay repayments on the interest. A repayment mortgage is where you pay interest plus capital. You're reducing your mortgage down, but if suddenly the interest rates move, the property market crashes, it may start squeezing your cash flow by having interest only mortgages, it just gives you that extra breathing space. And to be honest, really the majority of investors use interest only mortgages already. So if you're not, you probably want to be considering that for many reasons. And we've discussed that multiple times over the podcasts over the last few years. And an idea that we've nicked straight from Ed Atkinson, and I think it's a really interesting point. It's about concentrating the equity you've got in a few properties. So rather than having a whole portfolio of properties, all of which are moderately leveraged, it might be better in the event of a crash to have a couple of properties that are very low geared. Reason for that is that if, say, house prices crash by 15%, as we saw in the last couple of recessions, 15% is wiped off the value of all your properties. That might leave you with no equity left, depending on what your loan to value ratio was. In that situation, there's not a lot you can do that doesn't really help you out. But if you have one or two properties that have got all the equity in them, then you can sell those one or two properties to raise the cash you need to subsidize the rest of the portfolio to see you through the rest of the crash. The impact of this might be that the others are in negative equity, but it doesn't matter because as long as you're not forced to sell, it doesn't really matter whether you're in negative equity because you know that prices are eventually going to come back up. It's this whole long term investment that we've talked about. So this is similar to something we talked about earlier, whereas like in the winner's curse period, it might be the time to offload a couple of properties that aren't your best performers at that time when anyone will buy anything. Great time to get rid. But if you don't want to do that, then you can just have your equity concentrated in one or two properties so you know that if you need to you can sell those to raise cash so it's a really interesting idea because it doesn't affect your overall loan to value but it does give you the extra flexibility okay so what have we learned well i think it's important to remember there's going to be good times but there will also be bad times and that's why we always talk about investing for the long term and riding out the dips to ride out the dips cash flow is king we've said that so many times because it's true not saying you have to own really dirt cheap properties with with like silly high yields, but you also don't need to have loss making portfolio that's gambling on capital growth. The key is to avoid buying at the wrong time and basically doing the opposite of what the average person does. And they pile in right near the end of the cycle. And that's what happened last time. So you don't have to buy into the 18 year timing to be able to see the signs. We've discussed some of them already, but it's a great principle to follow. But at the moment, don't panic. It's important to take these on board, practice some of the principles, because they're good principles whatever time you are in the cycle. But are we predicting a crash? No. Will there be a wobble in the next four years? Probably. Will there then be a boom afterwards? We think so. But we'll see. We haven't got crystal balls. It's all theory. So by putting some of the things we've said into practice, you'll be far better placed as and when it happens. Okay, so I hope we've delivered on the promise of this episode. We called it How to Survive a Property Crash. And there you go. That was five different ideas for how to survive a property crash. And the key insight for me is that the knowledge of the property cycle allows you to see what's coming down the tracks and act accordingly and make your preparations to allow you to get the timing right because timing is everything. You don't have to buy into the exact timing. Just knowing that it's coming, knowing that things aren't going to be all rosy forever will allow you to put plans in place and make sure you'll be okay without being ultra, ultra cautious. You don't have to have a portfolio with ultra low leverage in order to be safe. And I hope we've managed to convey that idea to you. This leads us in really nicely to our resource of the week. I said earlier that we had borrowed a lot of ideas from a listener, Ed Atkinson, who very graciously gave the Property Podcast credit. He said that he never would have put this together had it not been inspired by the podcast. But really, we should be giving credit to him because he's contributed a lot of ideas to this episode. He's also contributed our resource of the week, which is a really 
fascinating spreadsheet that he's put together i call myself the property geek i'm going to have to hang up my crown and pass it over because this is a geeky spreadsheet but an absolutely amazing one because what it allows you to do is put in the details of your portfolio and it basically tells you how you would have fared in the last five recessions so you can just put in the details of your portfolio and it'll tell you based on the value, the loan to value, the amount of cash reserves that you've got, interest rates and so on. It'll tell you exactly what would have happened. Would you have been wiped out by the recession in 2008, in 1990? It'll tell you. And it's absolutely fascinating to see it. And then but once you've done that, you can manipulate the variables. So you can see, oh, well, if I'd had another £10,000 of cash in the bank, what difference would it have made? And it allows you to play out these scenarios. It's absolutely brilliant. It's a spreadsheet which you can download from the show notes for this episode, which are at thepropertyhub.net slash crash. So a huge thank you to Ed for the time and effort and the resources you've created. They are brilliant. We've been so impressed. And I know you will too. So make sure you go to that link. Take advantage of the other links we've talked about as well. We have really enjoyed putting this episode together. Over the last week, you know, Rob's been in his element because he's got a geeky partner to work with. So um, thank you, Ed, for um, taking that burden away from me because I just can't cope. Um, <laughs> but in all seriousness, it's a, a really must listen to episode this one so make sure you pass it around and, and tell people about these resources as well because it's important yes to take advantage of the good times but also be prepared for when you know the inevitable crashes come in the future another big thank you of course goes to the people who leave us lovely kind reviews and this week our thanks and gratitude goes to Anch. and Anch says I've recently found this podcast and it's brilliant. It's an absolute godsend. There is so much useful information and the near on 100 podcasts is unreal. I haven't managed to listen to all of them yet, but so far I'm very impressed. If you find them a bit cheesy at first, keep listening and you'll get used to it. It's just Rob and Rob's humour, which does brighten up some of the dull and boring stuff. Keep up the good work, guys. Would love some of your podcasts on self-building for profit and developing in general, if you're looking for diversity slightly. Great suggestions. They'll definitely go on our list. And uh, thank you for getting through the cheesiness to get to the good stuff. (laughs) It's quite a a fair summary in general, isn't it? Don't worry, you'll get used to them. I think that, that that's pretty much fair. <laughs> so hope you've enjoyed this episode. Next week, another great one. Really looking forward to this one. The Property Podcast Live, we're calling it. You'll find out more about what that's all about. And we're doing it to celebrate the launch of the magazine, which we've talked about. If it hasn't hit your doormat yet, it will be doing so any day now. So next week, we're going to be using the special live event to celebrate that. We will, and that's going to be a really good episode because we'll be recording it live, as the name <laughs> explains. So we really are relying on our editor to get us through that one. Well, you'll see a bit more of exactly how we are when the mic switches on and we haven't got that support network. So that's us for another week. Covered a lot of ground in this in this podcast, so I hope you've enjoyed it. Make sure you go to the show notes. There's so much in this one. It's thepropertyhub.net forward slash crash. All the links we've talked about, all the resources we've talked about will be there. Make sure you take advantage of them because it's all free. And remember, if you want to join the conversation, that'll give you a link to the Property Hub discussion board as well, where we'll be discussing this particular podcast. But until next week, when we go live for a QA and a session, thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful week, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to The Property Podcast. Make sure you join our mailing list at thepropertypodcast.com. And remember, we love five-star reviews. Rob even loves them more than air miles.